Welcome to the last lecture of this course. Today, I want to, I'm a bit ambitious, I want to cover a number of things, but not at the level that we've been covering topics before, but just, you know, give, to, to help give you a bigger picture, the bigger picture. So, we'll, we'll talk about tensor networks in, uh, in more than one dimension, okay? I also want to give you an idea of what happens with statistical mechanics, how these same techniques can be applied not just to quantum systems, but also to statistical mechanics, to, compute, to computing partition functions. And also, I'll mention briefly holography. And I hear that Freddy mentioned holography, or tensor networks in holography yesterday, which I missed. Very good. So, let's start with tensor networks in more than one special dimension. And for that, what I mean by that, I'll, I want to cover two aspects here briefly, but hopefully we'll get the main point. I want to talk about what happens with the area law in higher dimensions, how to have tensor networks that, um, that are compatible with this area law, that can reproduce this area law. Um, and also, I want to, in higher dimensions, I also want to be able to go beyond the area law. I want to be able to account for the logarithmic correction to it that we see in some ground states if in two and higher dimensional systems. Okay. So that's what I want to do. And we start by just remembering a lesson we'll learn in one dimension, which is there is a relation between how we've connected the tensors together, right? We want to build a tensor network for a given system. It is a relation between how we connect the tensors together and uh, correlations and also entanglements. So remember very briefly that in one dimension, if we use a matrix product state, then the two-point correlator between this point and that point decay exponentially in L. Uh, and we could interpret this as exponential in the distance within the tensor network between these two points. And then applying the same principle, we saw that in the mirror, uh, we also had that the two-point correlator were related to the exponential of the distance within the tensor network of two boundary points. And the difference between these two cases was that the distance within the tensor network here was L, whereas the distance within the tensor network here was log L. And that accounted, that implied getting exponential decaying correlations, and in this case, polynomial decaying correlations. So that was all about being able to define a distance in this um, geometry given by the tensor network. And then entanglement entropy had to do with connectivity. How hard it is to, to break our tensor network so that we have our region A uh, separated from the rest, okay? And in the MPS, that could be done by breaking two bonds, regardless of the size of A, regardless of L. And that gave us a constant, at an upper bound, constant upper bound to the entropy, whereas in the meta, the, the larger the region you had down here, the more bonds you had to break in order to split the tensor network into two pieces, okay? And that number of bonds that we had to break had to do with, um, were related to the region L, the size of the region. So 2L by uh, how many scales we had to go up and then down. And, the, um, and so that was log L, okay? Very good. So. We want to go to higher dimensions. And one thing we can do is we can try to think about how to generalize these two types of tensor networks. So if we take the MPS, the MPS, remember the geometry of the lattice and the geometry of the tensor network are the same, a one-dimensional array. So if we bring this to two dimensions, we will end up with this projected entangled pair state or pets, okay? And what we do here is if we want to represent the wave function of a two-dimensional lattice, we just connect tensors into a two-dimensional array following the lattice, okay? That's one thing we can do. And we'll briefly see now that uh, as a result, the resulting tensor network generically will have, again, power, uh, sorry, exponential decay of correlations, and there will be an area law, okay? Which is what we expect in, in a class of ground states in two dimensions. It turns out that also 
by fi fine tuning the parameters in this case, you could actually, this is not a generic case, but you could also have power law decay of correlations. Okay? So, so this in two dimensions, it's not, uh, the, the picture is not so simple um, in the sense that PEPs can be used both for ground states of GAT systems and of GATless systems. And, and then there will be some generalization. You take the same ideas from the middle and you can put them in two dimensions. And I refuse to draw it. <laughs> but, well, actually this morning I've been drawing a lot. You'll see in a minute. But, uh, um, but what we'll see is that, that we'll have generically, if we generalize this structure to two dimensions, we'll have um, power law decay of correlations and an entropy which scales as the area law. Okay, so we will be missing, in this generalization, we'll be missing a mechanism to generate the logarithmic corrections in two dimensions, and we'll address that later. Question? I'm looking at how you could generate a power law from a FIPS state. Okay, give me a second. So let me quickly go through our questions, okay? But this time, you know, half a, half a minute per question. Efficient representation. Well. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, so, oh, I, I didn't say anything. Uh, <laughs> can how many tensors? It's proportional to the number of sides. Okay. If we fix the one dimension of the tensors, each tensor has a finite number of coefficients, which does not depend on n. So, the total number of parameters we need to specify the wave function okay, is proportional to the number of sides. Okay. Very good. So, efficient manipulation. Okay. Let's compute the norm of this. Now there will be a, a nasty surprise. So we have psi, bracket, and now we contract all these indices. Okay. And let's take this and let's look at it from the top. The net result is, is something that looks like a square lattice of tensors, where each tensor here um, corresponds to having contracted A and A star, so coming from the brand from the cat. Okay. So if you want each index here is double index compared to what we had here for, for the for the original tensor network. And now, if we want to compute this scalar product, we have to contract this tensor network. Okay? But as I told you, there is no efficient way of doing that. Okay? So if you want to contract a two-dimensional tensor network, and there is no other trick available, or there are no constraints on the tensors, anything that will simplify this, this calculation, then the cost is exponential. Assuming that one, well, it's, it's exponential in the linear side. So if this was n times n, then the cost is just exponential in n, and there are no shortcuts. Okay? So, so that could be it. But it turns out that, and this is actually what happens um, if you take, if you want to a priori, if they give you a PEPS distance or network, and you want to compute the norm a priori, you would not be able to do that efficiently. Okay? But it turns out that if you use these PEPs to encode the ground state of a local Hamiltonian, there are locality kicks in. There, there are some um, not rigorous, but uh, in practice, well, well uh, experienced uh, facts that, that say that you can contract this approximately. Okay? So we won't be able to extract this number exactly, but we have approximation schemes which are then um, efficient. So basically, if you look at this, you could think of this as a two-dimensional problem where now you could use tensor network techniques to, for instance, take the row. If you look at this, or the, let, let's look at the upper row. This looks like a matrix product state. It's a matrix product state. Okay? So you could think that you have a matrix product state on top, and this layer of tensors is like a time evolution. So you could um, go in this direction would be similar to uh, performing a time evolution. Okay? And you, what you can do is you can systematically um, take your top matrix product state and apply one row of tensors to it, and then the one index effectively grows, but then you can truncate and apply the next row and so on. So you can, you can well, there are a number of precisely tensor network techniques that are used to contract this scalar product. Okay? But approximately. And still it's good enough to, to make progress. Okay, so now let's look at structural properties. Two-point correlator. Oh, sorry. Um, what I said about the scalar product applies also to local observables. Okay, so no exact efficient algorithm, but 
um, plenty of useful approximate um, algorithms which are efficient. Okay, so two-point correlator, we have to do this thing. Um, we have to multiply the brand, the cat, and two insertions. And let's suppose that we've done that, and now these tensors have double indices, each of them. And then we have the two insertions. Okay, that's the scalar product we had a moment ago, but with two insertions. And now, what, what do we expect? Well, actually, it's not so easy to argue, but in practice, what we see is that generically, for a random choice of these tensors, what, what we find is that there are exponential correlations. Okay? And you can think of this in terms of you know, that the correlations between these two points are mediated mostly through the tensors in between. Okay? So if that was the case, then it's, it's a transfer matrix problem again. Okay? You can imagine that the rest of tensors are not playing a very important role, and only the tensors between the two insertions are the ones carrying the correlations. And then you see that you are multiplying um, a number of L, L times by some form of transfer matrix. That would be how you would justify um, what you see in practice, which is that generically you have uh, exponential decay of correlations. But we also see in practice that if you fine tune the, 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 the parameters, the variational parameters in the PEPs, from time to time you can find um, also power law decay. Okay, And if you want to reconcile this fact with what we just said before. Um, well, what we said before is it, you expect exponential decay if, if the correlations between this point and this point are mostly mediated by the tensors in between. But imagine now that that's not what's happening and that not only the tensors in between contribute but also tensors nearby. Okay? And th then what you can imagine happening is that um, that the accumulation of contributions from neighboring tensors, the, the ones that are right in between, but also the ones that are farther away, um, add together to give rise to this, this different scaling. Okay. And now the easy part. This gives rise, if we look at the entanglement entropy of a region of size L times L, okay, we get that it's very simple to get an upper bound which is given by, that reproduces this area law, okay? What we're saying is that by construction, if we try to split the wave function of a region L times L, we'll have to cut a number of bond indices which is proportional to the size of the boundary of the region, right? So if the region is L times L, the size of the boundary is proportional to L, and there we have it. This is the area law, okay? Very good. So PEPS um, has these properties which make it a good candidate for ground states of two-dimensional gap systems, maybe also gapless. Okay. And that's this generalization. Let me also discuss this other generalization so we can try to have meta in two dimensions. Um, so let me simplify the drawings. Okay. Uh, imagine that this is full of rows of these entanglers and isometries. So here we have the physical indices, and we have layers of meta on top. Okay? That would be our description of the wave function. So if we want to do the same in two dimensions, what you can imagine, if this was the one-dimensional system sitting here, the, your spin chain, now what we have is a two-dimensional lattice. Okay? That's the system um, for which we want to describe the ground state. And what we do is we, we draw, we have a, a similar structure as before, but spreading into two dimensions. So again, we have, you know, the story would be the same. There is a quantum circuit that goes from the top to the bottom, preparing the ground state. Okay? There is a notion of coarse graining if you go in the other direction, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's, you, know, you, can, you can fill this with tensors, with isometric constraints, and, and then you get a two-dimensional mirror. Very good. So 1D meta, how do we compute the scalar product? That was a piece of cake because due to the isometric constraints of all the tensors here, there were cancellations pairwise, right? And the whole tensor network simplified to one, to a number. We didn't have to compute. So the same story is true now in two dimensions. We've built this, this tensor network here in such a way that when we 
compute the scalar product, there are cancellations, okay? And you don't need to worry about computing anything. That's, that wave function is normalized from the start. Very good. So what about computing um, observables? What we saw yesterday with, with Meta in 1D is that if you put an insertion here, then the cancellations between top and bottom tensors are not possible anymore everywhere. They are possible away from the insertion, but not in a region that we call causal cone, the causal cone of the insertion. And that what that meant is that this tensor network simplified into a one-dimensional tensor network where this dimension is scale, okay? It corresponds to scale. It does not correspond to the physical one dimension we started from, but it corresponds to the scales in the system. And then we could, we could efficiently contract this because it's a matrix multiplication problem where you multiply many matrices as you move through scale. So what's the deal in two dimensions? Actually, exactly the same, okay? If you put an insertion, then the cancellations are no longer possible near the insertion. And you're left with, again, a one-dimensional structure which um, runs through scale. So it's the same principle. You may think, oh, here I have a tensor network which is two dimensions plus an additional dimension. Actually, when you try to compute the uh, expectation values, the physical dimensions disappear, both in 1D and in 2D. And you're left just with uh, uh, the, the, the work that you have to do is to contract a tensor network that spreads only through scale. So it's a one dimensional tensor network, and we know how to efficiently do that. OK? Is that clear? Okay, so two-point correlators. Uh, two-point correlators, what we do is we put two insertions. That was in the 1D case, okay? And then we had the more complicated structure that was left, which again corresponds to the causal cone of these two insertions. So the, the blue parts simplify, but the yellow parts stay. And therefore, the work of Computing two-point correlators had to do with contracting this tensor network. And now, remember that there were log two sc scales involved in going from here to here. And then that resulted, in the case of a scale invariant meta, that resulted in um, the correlators decaying as some eigenvalue to the log L power. And that automatically implied power law decay of correlations, okay? Because lambda log L was equal to L log lambda. And so that's already a power law. Okay, so in the two-dimensional case, pretty much the same happens, okay? You put the two insertions, there are simplifications in many places except for this. And you're left that this, this two-point correlator is the result of, again, multiplying log L times some, you know, by some transfer matrix, okay? And therefore, we'll have power law decay of correlations again. Is that clear? I'm just you know, extracting some of the aspects that we saw yesterday, a bit quickly perhaps, but I'm pointing out that the same principles apply in any dimension, actually. I said two dimensions, but you can do that in three and so on. Very good. So finally, entropy, entanglement entropy. And that's where the big disappointment will come if we wanted to see a logarithmic correction in two dimensions, okay? So how did we compute the entanglement entropy? Imagine this is the ansatz in one and two dimensions. We want a region. We want to have an upper bound to the entropy in, in this region here, region A of size L. Okay? And so what we saw is that there was a minimal way of cutting or splitting the tensor network into two pieces. Right? And that had to do with going up in scale and down. That was the, the, the way of splitting this tensor network into two pieces while cutting the smallest possible number of bonds, bond indices, and that gave us the best upper bound to the entanglement entropy. So in 2D, same thing will happen. You can imagine you have your two-dimensional lattice. Now you can see the sum region. The region is living in here, down here. And then we'll find the best, the optimal way of splitting the tensor network into two pieces, OK? Very good. So what happened in 1D? In 1D, we had that if we look at how many indices we're cutting, there were contributions coming from each scale, okay? 
but each scale was contributing the same number of indices that we had to cut. Okay? So there were, if this is size L, we had to go up log L scale. So the number of contributions being the same from each length scale ended up being log of L. So the entropy, the entropy was upper bounded by the number of indices we had to cut, and the number of indices we had to cut to split the wave function into two was log L. Okay? So we obtained this scaling for the entropy log L. So if we try to do the same in two dimensions, then you should remember some calculation we had last week because it's the same. When we try to split the wave function into two pieces here, what we find is that there are, again, contributions from each scale. Okay? But the number of indices that contribute, the number of indices that we have to cut at the lowest scale is proportional to L. Remember, L is the size of the boundary of our region. As we go up in scale, effectively, the region is shrinking. Okay? So it contributes, we have to cut, you know, it has less boundary, so we have to cut less indices. So the first, at the lowest scale, we get L contributions, then the next scale, we get L over 2. And the next one, L over 4, and so on. Okay? So we still get log 2 a log to L contributions because there are contributions from all length scales, but not all length scales contribute the same. Okay? And in practice, the first scale contributes, say, order one, then the next scale contributes half of it, one fourth, and so on. So when you add together these numbers, this is upper bound by two, and so we get L um, as the scaling of the entropy. Okay? No logarithmic correction. Okay? Very good. So this was the case for several years, and then uh, there were you know, attempts to, to, to understand how to simulate systems in two dimensions, how to simulate ground states in two dimensions with a tensor network that would be able to reproduce a logarithmic correction. And uh, a couple of, day, uh, of, of years ago, um, a solution was proposed, and that's what I want to describe next. But are there questions here first? Okay, so what I want to do now is to explain how to go beyond this um, area law in two dimensions. Okay? And the solution is known as branching meta. And of course, I should explain this in two dimensions because that's where we were trying to solve the problem. But I'll explain it in just one dimension because there is no way to draw this in a reasonable way in two dimensions. So I want us to look at this and recognize that this is quantum circuit for the meta in one dimension. Okay? Remember that at some point we said, let's look at the meta as a quantum circuit. And what we did was we replaced the isometries with disentanglers, the, the, the tensors with two legs going into one. We replaced them with two to two tensors. And then we pulled the state zero all the way to the top. Okay? And the result was this, that we had, I mean, I've reorganized this a little bit, but they said this is the quantum circuit that you had for a meta, okay? And if you look at this, it looks interesting. It looks like we are splitting the system at each, every two layers, okay, of, the, of the, now these entanglers. We're splitting the system into two types of degrees of freedom. But a subset, half of the, of the spins will continue in, involved in, non-trivially in, in a circuit, and the rest are set to zero, okay? That's, that's what the meta is doing. At each iteration, it's getting rid of half of the degrees of freedom, half of the spins. And by getting rid of means setting them to zero. OK, but there is no need to do that. Okay? You could consider the possibility of having these degrees of freedom, instead of setting them to zero, just have them be part of a circuit as well. Okay? And if you do it in this way, the advantage of doing that is that you can still, all the, all the discussion about can we efficiently contract this tensor network, can we efficiently extract information, I'm not going to demonstrate that, but it's still possible. Okay? That's, you know, this is not a random quantum circuit. It has been designed you know, very carefully, but one of the properties it has is that you can still efficiently evaluate expectation values of local observables. Okay? And, and so there, there is a lot of freedom in how you design this. For instance, here once more, we recognize the usual meta in 1D. Okay. We have this 
maximally branched meta where each branch, all the degrees of freedom that you get every time you branch the system into two pieces, all the degrees of freedom remain um, involved in, in a circuit of its own. Or we could have something in between where, say, at this level, we take, we, we split the degrees of freedom into two parts. And then at this level, we continue to do that. But at this level, when we break them again, or split them again, a subset does not have a quantum circuit anymore. It just set to zero and the other not. Okay? So you can you can play around with different levels of branching. We call this. So I hope you, you recognize this. The pattern of a branching that we have here where um, can be can be written or can be drawn as a as a tree. Okay? What we're saying is that there is in this case one branch which remains uh, for, for which there is a non-trivial circuit all the way to the top, to the lar largest scales, um, whereas the rest of the circuit becomes trivial. Okay? It goes straight into zeros. And in the maximally branch meta, you have that all the branches uh, contribute in the same way. And then you have options in between. And the point of this construction is that the entanglement, the scaling of entanglement, depends is affected by the branching structure. Okay, so this plot here is a plot of entropies. Um, it's log L versus entropy. So if you see a straight line, that corresponds to this logarithmic scaling that we've been using in the meta for critical systems in one day. Okay. And what we're saying is that, uh, remember, the motivation was we saw how entanglement scales in ground states. And that was the hint to develop new strategies to efficiently represent wave functions. But it's interesting that after that, we've understood how to generalize these tensor networks, such that now we can actually have volume law, okay, while keeping efficient representation. So we can efficiently represent and extract information from the wave function, but we're no longer constrained to having a small amount of entanglement. Okay? The branching meter is an example where the entanglement in 1D can fulfill a volume law, not an area law. And yet we still retain all these properties uh, of efficient representation and efficient contractability. Um, we still don't know what these states, these, these states here, which have volume law, they are still non-generic in the Hilbert space because you know, they, they, they can be efficiently represented. And generic state in the Hilbert space cannot be efficiently represented. It requires exponentially many parameters. But we still don't even understand what what these these states, these branching middle states, are good for, or what what do they represent physically? Okay, so that's that's still unknown. But in any case, this was an illustration in one day that that we can now beat um, the area law, the, the logarithmic corrections to it, and so on. There you go. So how does this work in practice? Well, what's happening is that um, suppose ignore this part here. Okay, if you ignore this part of the of the tensor network, then you would obtain this part here, which corresponds to the regular meta. And what we said is that the entropy on meta is a contribution from different length scales. Right? We've been saying that how many bonds we have to break. Well, th there are contributions, bonds that we have to break coming from different length scales. If you have a branching structure, what's gonna happen is that different branches will contribute to this entropy. Okay? So for instance, if we had two branches, instead of a logarithm, we'll get sum from, well, two contributions that are logarithms. Of course, the sum of two logarithms is a logarithm, so we will not change the asymptotics in this case, but I'm, I'm illustrating the fact that we can add contributions from the different branches to the entropy. And then, um, if you do that, it turns out that, depending on the branching pattern, in one special dimension, you can go from log the logarithm uh, scaling all the way to the volume, so L. And in larger dimensions, you can also go from the area law all the way to the volume law. Okay, So L to the D minus 1 all the way to L to the D. And in between, for a particular pattern of branching, you see these logarithmic corrections. So for, for this particular pattern of branching that gives rise to logarithmic corrections, a test the, the, there are tests that have been made where you can see that actually 
this wave function, this tensor network, this branching meta, is a good representation of ground states of two-dimensional uh, fermionic, free fermionic systems with logarithmic corrections. Exactly homework number two, which I hear some of you managed to complete. Um, <laughs> for that state, that state you can efficiently represent it with a branching meta. Okay. Okay. So, if, yeah, let's let's then put this all together. Right. That's one of the conclusions of the whole course. We have in the second week we saw the scaling of entanglement entropy. We saw that we could. Um, Look at it at different for ground states, a different number of special dimensions, one, two, and three. What we saw is that gap systems always obey an area law, which in one dimension means a constant, in two dimensions L, in three dimensions L squared, and so on. So we had this area law. Um, and in larger dimensions, well, so, sorry, and, and for gapless systems, we had two possibilities. So in one dimension, there was always a logarithmic correction, but in two dimensions, we could have a, either area law or a logarithmic correction to it, and the same in three dimensions. And this depended on the, how large the Fermi surface was. Okay? Very good. So what I'm saying is that, well, we saw um, this week that we had a matrix product state that had the right properties to describe ground states of gap systems in one dimension, and a meta that, was, that had the right properties to describe the ground state of gapless systems in one dimension. And today, I've argued that there are ansatz, peps, and meta that naturally are naturally fitted to describe ground states in higher dimensions, except the logarithmic correction that now we understand that can be reproduced with a branching meta. Okay, so we've covered all the table. For every single type of scaling that we have observed in nature, in the ground state of, gap, of, of a local Hamiltonian, we have found a tensor network that matches that behavior. And that implies that we can, in principle, efficiently simulate the system. Okay? So that's the tensor network program. Um, but I have to say that, sure, in one dimension, it's been a very clear success. In more than, more than um, one dimension, so two dimensions, say two dimensions, um, we have the theory. We have proofs of principle. But in practice, there is a computational overhead there that we still we are st still fighting it. So it's very clear that these descriptions do not scale exponentially in the system size. Okay? It's, they are just linear. But still, you have to, you know, there is a bond dimension. You have to contract all these tensor numbers. This is the part that we have not seen in this course, how to actually do these calculations. And that comes at an important cost. It's not a problem of system size. It's just an order one cost when it comes in terms of the system size. But there, there, is a, this is, there are many problems that are, or there are many systems that are still challenging because the contraction of these huge tensor networks is too expensive. So there is a lot of, there is need for progress in two dimensions and in three dimensions that the situation is even worse. Again, as a matter of principle, we think we got it, okay? But there is a lot of work to be done until we can see, um, uh, until we can start systematically solving problems in three dimensions. Okay, any questions? I'm going to change subject. Very good. Yeah? Is something that branching mirror corresponds to in one dimension? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Oh, is there something that branching mirror corresponds to in one dimension? Um, right. Um, so, if you had just two branches, for instance, you could think of physical systems. In one dimension, if you have a system of electrons, interacting electrons in a quantum wire, if you look at the system, the system, the fundamental degrees of freedom are, are in, or at least in the, we write a Hamiltonian for electrons. Electrons have charge and have a spin, right? Now, if you look at that system at lower energies, it turns out that when you excite the system, say you, you, you get it in the ground state and now you excite it, you see some things propagating, some elementary excitations propagating in the system. If you look at it, there are two types. There are spin um, degrees of freedom that you can see how the magnetization moves around the system. And completely independently, you see charge degrees of freedom, okay? density moving around. And one goes faster than the other. You know, those. So what you see is that you started with some 
simple, single type of fundamental or microscopic degrees of freedom. But the system at low energies organizes itself as if it was made of two different types of degrees of freedom that don't talk to each other. Okay? And this is the physics that the branching mirror is capturing. That as that some one unique microscopic degree of freedom turns or decouples into different uh, effective degrees of freedom at long distances. Okay? That's what the branching mirror is doing. You, you constrain your system, and at some point you realize that at that length of scale that you have acquired, the, um, there are pieces, there are degrees of freedom that are not talking to each other anymore. So in one dimension, the branching mirror could be a good description or could be a way of um, bringing out this factorization of degrees of freedom at long distances. Okay. Um, in the beginning of all these lecture courses, like you mentioned that the tensor network it, like, is a variational approach, but yes. it somehow solved the biasness of the any other variational oh, approach. You were listening, huh? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I remember I said that, yes. Yeah. Um, up to now, I, I'm not so clear how tensor network go around the biases. Look, okay, it's not clear, I, but look at this table. All I said here is the ground. All, all I used is to I, I, I said ground states of gap systems in one D have this bound area law, right? So the amount of entanglement of a region uh, is proportional to the size of the boundary of the region. That is true for all gap systems. Okay. And we have an ansatz that is not that, that is reproducing this fact. Okay? Um, it's not reproducing ferromagnetism or antiferromagnetism or you know, any it's not committing to any type of physics. It's only what we're seeing is just this general fact that it applies to to all ground states of gap Hamiltonians in one day. It doesn't follow that the NPS is a good answer. It does not follow from that. Okay? To see that, you, you would have to start using it and say that systematically, for all types of ground states, you get the right answer. It does not follow logically from this. But I'm saying that we build these answers based on these very general um, properties that apply to all, all ground states. That was the intuition that was followed in order to create these answers. It was not, oh, I want, uh, the wave function is, is not specialized. At least by construction, it w right? The intention was not to accomplish certain type of um, uh, microscopic phenomena. Okay. okay, very good. So let's move on then. I want to uh, mention two more topics. And the next one is tensor networks in statistical mechanics, partition functions. Um, there are two things I want to mention here. One is that we can apply very similar ideas that we've been discussing, and in particular, the removal of short range entanglement through these entanglers to analyze, to build energy flow in the space of statistical partition functions. Okay. And then we'll also, I want also to, to mention that while working with statistical partition functions, suddenly we saw that we would obtain meta out of it in some in some way that was not expected at all. OK, so let me do that. Um, remember that during the first class, the first week, we had um, we analyzed the quantum spin IZ model, okay? and then the partition function for the 2D classical IZ model. And those were two completely different objects, but they started behaving in the same way at some point. Okay? And I, what we will see now is, is more of the same. So, you can think of the Euclidean path integral or an Euclidean time evolution for a 1D quantum system as an object that lives in one dimension of a space and one dimension of Euclidean time. And that um, is some, somewhat similar, at least um, formally, to a two-dimensional classical partition function where you have, again, a two-dimensional object, but these two dimensions correspond to space. Okay? Space and Euclidean time, space and space. OK, so it turns out that, as you saw already during the first week, we can actually write, at least you saw that the two-dimensional classical partition function could be written as a tensor network. Okay? But this was not an answer. This was an exact description. What we did was we took the Boltzmann weights, 
of the, of the two-dimensional classical Ising model, and we wrote them locally as tensors, and we multiply all the tensors together, and that was our partition function. Well, you can do something very similar with Euclidean path integral. Okay? So here, tensor networks are not an approximation, are an exact representation. Okay? We're just saying, let's, let's write things as a tensor network. Okay, and now the goal would be, uh, so, so there are tensors here, and the goal could be to compute this, okay? But if you look at this, this looks like the scalar product of a PEPS with itself that we saw before. So whatever tools, tensor network tools we've been developing to contract PEPS can automatically be applied here, okay? And that's one of the things that you can do with statistical mechanics. You write your partition function of a classical system as a tensor network. And then you use tensor network techniques to contract it and compute the partition function, the number that it represents. What I want to discuss, though, is something. I'll, uh, I mean, this is being this has been done successfully, but I want to discuss another type of research that has been done in this direction, which is we take this partition function as expressed as a tensor network in two dimensions, and we define an RG flow in the space of of these tensor networks, which means that we come up with some strategy. I don't think you can see this very clearly, but now we have that these tensors, four of them are grouped together, okay? And replaced by an, a cos grain tensor. Each tensor here corresponds to four tensors there. And we could iterate this, okay? So if we define, if we manage to define a tensor network, um, uh, sorry, a, a cos grain transformation in the space of tensor networks, then we could use this to have an RG flow for partition functions. Question? But, um, when you attach four tensors to four one, then the index indices would get a lot bigger, right? Yeah, and that so would be a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, but we, so we would have to cross grain to truncate that index in some way. Okay? So this is part of the magic. This is part of what we need to do. So we want to, to keep the computational cost in check, and that requires uh, some effort. And let me mention that there have been, over the years, many proposals. Maybe one of the most important ones is by Levy and Nate in 2006, called Tensor Renormalization Group. They understood how to systematically truncate these bone indices that were growing okay, to actually compute, uh, obtain the, an efficient uh, calculation for gap systems. All right, so what I want to briefly discuss is that as of just one year ago, there is an alternative method which happens to be look complicated. So this, this is the steps that you take in order to, to go from A to A prime, in order to cause grain four tensors into one. And there are many details. And even if I had more time, I don't think they would be very interesting. But, but I want to point out the key of this approach, which is introduction of disentanglers okay, to remove short range correlations. This is a classical system, but you can still introduce unitary transformations to reorganize locally your degrees of freedom, and then isometries to truncate these degrees of freedom. Now, the previous proposals, TRG, the one I just mentioned from 2006, had this, this part here. It was taking two, side, two, two indices into one through isometries, okay? but it did not have these disentanglers. And so what has happened in, in the last, um, and this is quite recent, uh, we're talking about the last year, is that thanks to that, we have, so we now have an RG flow in the space of tensor networks that reaches fixed points where you would expect them, okay? And what do I mean by this? I mean that let's, let's, let's take the partition function that you considered during the first week, the Ising model. Partition function for the 2D classical Ising model. Um, what, what you have there is that if the temperature is below the critical temperature, Okay, you are in, in a gap phase. That's the, the uh, symmetry breaking phase. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the sequence of tensors that we obtain through cross graining and I'm going to plot them. What do I plot exactly here is, you know, this, these tensors have four legs, but if you put two together and two together, that's a matrix, right? And now once you have a matrix, you could just have a plot of the different components of the matrix, at least of, of how large, how, how different from zero they are. So if, if you take black as zero, white as large, this is a plot of a matrix, okay? Where you see that there are a number of um, 
large coefficients in white, uh, smaller coefficients in yellow and red and so on. Okay? So this is telling you you have some form of matrix there with a number of coefficients. And now what you can study is what happens to this matrix during, uh, as you iterate this Korsgaard transformation. And what you see in general is that when I say matrix, I mean you know, a, a matrix form of a tensor. right? So what we're following is the RG flow of tensors as we change the scale, as we cross-grain more and more. And what we see is that these tensors are changing. Okay? And they flow towards a very, very simple fixed point. Okay? A tensor that has only two non-zero components. Okay. What happens if you apply the same type of strategies with these entanglers um, to the critical fixed point? So now we take the temperature to be critical. So this is the partition function of the 2D criticalizing model. Now, 0 0.9 or 1, this is very similar, right? So when you start the flow, the tensors that you start from, they look very similar. And indeed, if you look at these two drawings, well, they are not exactly the same, but they are very similar. They have non-zero coefficients in the same places with roughly the same magnitude. That's because there is continuity with respect to temperature at the lo local level. But as you start cross-graining, now you see a completely different behavior from before. Actually, before, we were flowing towards a very simple fixed point. Now, we are actually stuck in a not so simple fixed point. Okay? And that's compatible with being at criticality. Criticality, we have a fixed point, right? Um, which is non-trivial. And finally, if, if we have temperature which is slightly above the critical temperature, then what we see when we apply the same cosine transformation is that there is a flow towards another fixed point. A very simple one, just one non-zero element here. Okay? So this, um, this is the type of flow that you get in the space of tensors when you constrain the tensor network that represents the partition function of a two-dimensional Classical system. Okay. Um, here, you're calculating the transfer matrix. No transfer matrix. The transfer matrix would have been um, a, a column of those tensors together. Here we're talking about individual tensors. So instead of working with the transfer matrix and multiplying in one direction, we, li we, we keep working at the level of individual tensors. And what we do is we put four together, and that defines an effective tensor. And we put four of those effective tensors together, and that defines the next tensor. This is this sequence here. Okay? This is the original tensor. This effectively accounts for four of the original tensors. This one would be 16 of the original tensors, and so on. Okay? So we're covering, we're looking at the same system at different line scales. Can you also draw the renormalization group flow with this calculation? The the usual coupling constant space? Um, it turns out that yes, but it's com uh, it's not, it doesn't follow from what I said. But the suggestion here is that you don't need to go to coupling space. Okay? That this is already a flow. You, know, you have a flow. You could consider the elements of these matrices as your space in which you flow. And then you see that you are flowing somewhere. That there are fixed points exactly where you would expect them. It turns out that, that, as we will see in a second, actually, if I remember, I'll make the connection. And yes, we can, from, from here will happen, it will so be the case that we will be able to go back to a space of Hamiltonians. Okay? Very good. So, so that's uh, an example of what you can do in statistical mechanics with tensor network techniques. And now let me make a connection to quantum systems, back to quantum systems. So remember the Euclidean path integral is this very similar, it, it, it can also be represented as a tensor network, where now the vertical direction corresponds to Euclidean time. And it turns out that the, this, Euclid, this partition function or Euclidean path integral is a number, but if instead of considering the whole um, number, you just make a cut, um, that corresponds to a Euclidean time evolution, where now we make a cut at some point. Okay? So if we had the whole plane, that would correspond to um, the Euclidean time evolution or the partition function on, on, on the infinite plane. 
But if we just consider the upper half plane, so imagine that we cut this central network somewhere, okay, what we have is actually what we know that should correspond to the ground state of the system. Right? If you time evolve in if you evolve in Euclidean time for a long, long time, you are collapsing to the ground state. So this should be this the tensor network that we obtain by taking this this tensor network and just considering the upper half plane. That will have that it will have a number of open indices and that will correspond to a representation of the ground state. And if instead we consider a strip, if we take the same Euclidean path integral but on a strip, what we get is a thermal state of temperature given beta is given by by the width of the strip. So this is known from I mean this is this has nothing to do with tensor networks, but what we want to do is we want to see what that implies for in the context of tensor networks. So remember, a ground state is just the result of a very long Euclidean time evolution. And what does this mean in terms of this tensor network? It means this, this picture here, we have this tensor network that represents the Euclidean time evolution on the upper half plane, which means that it has an open boundary here. Okay? All these indices, the, the tensor network goes on forever in that direction and upwards and to the right, but it, it stops here. It has open indices here. And what you can see is that indeed, it, this is a tensor network with open indices in a one dimensional array. This is your wave function. Okay? This tensor network is already your ground state wave function. Okay? So again, I didn't say anything that is not standard. Okay? I'm saying that we have a tensor network representation of the ground state from the start. This tensor network is not very useful because we cannot efficiently extract information from it. Okay? Giving this tensor network is, is as efficient as giving the Hamiltonian. Right? This, this tensor network just represents the exponential of the Hamiltonian. Um, if I give you a Hamiltonian, I have completely specified the ground state. Right? It's, you know, it's the lowest uh, energy eigen, the, the eigenvector with lowest ener, uh, eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. But I still don't know anything about the ground state. I don't know how to extract information from it. So this is the stage that we're here. We have completely specified the ground state, but we don't know any property of it. Okay. And what I'm saying is that this tensor network that looks like the partition, the, it's, it's formally it's a square tensor network. It's the same type of tensor network that we had a moment ago for the classical partition function, except that now we have a row of open indices. So what we can do is we can apply exactly the same techniques that we applied for the classical partition function. And remember, it was a very strange sequence of things that mapped initial tensor A into some tensor A prime. Okay? Every tensor here comes from a block of four tensors there. OK, so we can do this. But because there is a boundary, there, is a boundary, there will be some, um, some steps that will not happen in the boundary as they happen in the block. For instance, I told you this was a disentangler u and a u dagger. Of course, u and u dagger disappear in this step. But at the boundary, there is a u, but there is no u dagger because the u dagger would be on the lower half plane. So the disentanglers stay here. They cannot go away. Okay? And you do a few more steps. And here we have isometries, w, w dagger, that in the bulk will disappear. But at the boundary will not disappear because there is no uh, we, we, we have a cut, and this, this tensor would disappear if we put this, the lower half plane. What I'm saying is that by applying exactly the same transformation that I would, I would, I would apply for a classical partition function, when I apply it in the presence of a cut, okay, um, there is some obstruction to eliminating some, there is some residual set of tensors down here which are a row of disentanglers and a row of isometries, which connect the new degrees of freedom with the old degrees of freedom, okay? The microscopic degrees of freedom with the coarse grain ones. And, and now, if I look, if I ignore this, if I ignore this, what I get here is, is something that looks like the same as at the beginning. It's, it's a tensor network, a square tensor network on the upper half plane. So I can coarse grain this one again, okay? And the result will be similar to what we have here, which is a new layer of these entanglers and isometries. So the summary of the previous slide is that if, you, if I try to constrain the upper half plane, I get a new constrained version of the upper half plane plus a row of these entanglers and isometries. So if I constrain again the upper half plane, I get what? 
uh, per half plane with a new layer of these entanglers and isometers. Okay? And so if I iterate what's happening, I'm producing a mirror. Okay? We see that mirror, mirror was proposed as a variational ansatz. This is not a variational ansatz anymore. This is the byproduct of some, some procedure. Okay? And what this is telling us is that if this cost grain transformation does not incur, does not introduce important errors, it's not changing the object that we wanted from the beginning, well, what was this? This was the ground state. It was an Euclidean evolution by the Hamiltonian. If we then make lots of mistakes in the process, this is still the ground state. Except that now we have a mirror representation from it. Okay? So you might be confused. Oh, that was a tensor network representation. This is a tensor network representation. Why do I care? Well, remember, from this one, we can efficiently extract anything we want. We can compute expectation values. From this one, we did not know how to do that. Okay? So by stop, you know, we stopped working on, on quantum systems for a while. By trying to understand classical systems, we got back to quantum systems in a nice way because now we have a tensor network representation of the ground state, which is no longer an ansatz. It's guaranteed to be a representation of the ground state. It's not, we think that this might be a good representation of the ground state. Ground state of CFT? No, no, I didn't invoke scale invariance. So the tensors A, A prime, and so on, they don't have to be the same at each step. These tens this, this, this tensors here, they don't have to be the same at each step either. If this was a, uh, a critical system, we would recover scale invariance, but we did not assume that. So that the mirror-like structure may not be necessarily equivalent to the mirror we saw previously which have the same tensor for every Right. Time. When we analyze, when we try to get some intuition previously on what Meta was doing, we assume scale invariance in order to recover power decay of correlations. That was just, you know, cartoon picture. Or if you want something valid for in the case of a scale invariance. But if Meta can represent ground states which are not scale invariant, Meta can actually also reproduce uh, exponential decay of correlations. But if you are in the scale invariant regime, then you have power law decay. OK, so TNR, this tensor network renormalization, on, applied to the upper half plane, gave us the ground state mirror. Now, um, it turns out that if you, you know, if you play the same trick with a thermal state, remember, a thermal state can be understood as an Euclidean, time evolution, uh, an Euclidean evolution by the Hamiltonian by a finite time beta. Okay? Again, that is a statement that has nothing to do with tensor networks. But if you take this object and you express it as a tensor network, then you can apply tensor network techniques to evaluate this object. And when you do that exactly in the same way that we just did, meaning apply tensor network renormalization in the bulk, you take four tensors A into a tensor A prime. But at the boundary, now you have two boundaries, and the same thing happens as before. A layers that are residual tensors, these entanglers and isometries, isometries that appear. Okay? And then you can constrain this. Since beta is finite, you can do that lock beta steps and you are done. And you end up with an object like this. This object has some coarse grain tensors in, in the middle and then some layers of disentanglers and isometries. Okay? And so we actually didn't know. Um, this is a meta for a thermal state. This is a meta for the object we started from, okay? from which we can, again, efficiently uh, extract any information we want. The rules that I described how to efficiently contract this tensor network apply here as well. Okay? So it turns out, however, that before this, this construction, we did not even know how to optimize a thermal meta. Because if you have, a meta of, if you have an answer for the ground state, you have a clear rule there. How do you optimize it? You minimize the energy. But for a thermal state, the rule, it's, it's, very, it's much more complicated. Okay? You have to invoke some entropies, and it's not very clear how to proceed. So this gave us, as, uh, we, we have obtained here as a product, an, an expected product, um, a, a thermal meta for the first time. Okay? Very good. And now I'm running out of time. And what I was going to do here, I wanted to talk about tensor networks and holography. And all I wanted to say is something very similar to what Freddy said yesterday. I know not all of you went, attended his class, 
But as a matter of fact, if you don't know holography, it doesn't matter what I say. It's going to be hard anyway. So, so what I want to say is that you know, when you look at, at this tensor network, Meta, we already established that it was a very accurate. We established numerically that it was a very accurate representation of ground, of ground states of CFTs. And also, we, we, we've been insisting that it spreads in an additional dimension, a direction which corresponds to scale. But that very much sounds like the holographic principle, um, which relates a theory in some dimensions to a theory of gravity in an extra dimension, where this extra dimension is understood as a scale in the boundary theory. Um, so I think you know, uh, what, I'm, yeah, what I want to say here is that there are suggestions, the, the way we compute entropies, the way we compute correlators, this all suggests uh, it, the, it has analogs in holography. And so, based on those, there was at some point in 2009 a proposal by Brian Swingle that Meta was realizing on the lattice and this ADS CFT correspondence. And then there has been a number of important contributions by other people as well in this, which I don't have time to, to, to discuss. Um, I'm happy to talk about these things. Uh, I actually, Benny, this, this, there is this contribution by. Benny Yoshida and collaborators. Um, Benny is, is a postdoc here, five year, a senior postdoc at Perimeter. And he gave a talk on this yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to attend it. Um, maybe it's recorded on Pirsa. Uh, this is not a mirror. It's a tensor network that, again, has a similar shape, but it's, it's, it's a different proposal. And it's also being studied in, in relation to the bulk boundary correspondence. OK. So, and then there has been a more recent proposal which I, by Bartek Czech and collaborators, which I think establishes what meta is in relation to holography. So the key there is meta is a tensor network. It's, uh, we connect the tensors together. Okay? But it's also, um, it has also this, the tensors are constrained to be isometries and disentanglers. And if you take that into account, um, so if you just look at how you connect the tensors together, we, you could argue that this is the hyperbolic plane, and that would be a realization of ADS CFT in a straightforward way. Because in ADS CFT, you expect that if you take a time slice of ADS, that you get the hyperbolic plane. Okay? So, so this could be understood as a discretization of the hyperbolic plane, and we've been using um, arguments that relate to that. If we say two points here at, are at a distance L at the boundary, well, they are at a distance log L in the bulk. This is a statement about this is what would happen in the hyperbolic plane. Okay? So there, are, there was this intuition that Meta was discretizing the hyperbolic plane. But if we take into account that these antennas and isometries fulfill the rule, they annihilate each other, that gives us some, instead of uh, Euclidean metric, so what's happening in the hyperbolic plane is that all directions are equivalent. Okay? Whereas in Meta, they are not. Because there is a time direction, okay. So there is, in a sense, instead of having Euclidean, the, the signature instead of having Euclidean, the metric instead of having Euclidean signature, it should have Lorentzian signature. And that's what actually some people, um, Cedric Benny proposed a long time ago, and also recent work by uh, Bartek Czech and collaborators have been insisting on. And so instead of being hyperbolic plane, Meta is actually the sitter can be understood as a discretization of the sitter. And what does this mean? Well, it just means it's, it's holography in a different way. Okay? It turns out that this, this hyperbolic plane um, is related to, to the sitter uh, through uh, an integral transform, which has to do with mapping geodesics into points and points into geodesics. So there is a relation between hyperbolic plane and what we believe this is, which is I believe is the sitter. Um, and so this, in the end, this resulted in, in the fact that there was an original proposal back in 2009 that was saying Meta is a discretization of the ads CFT correspondence, is a discrete, discrete version of that. And the newest version of that is pointing at the fact that, no, that it's, it's not actually that. It's something else. But it's pointing at a different form of holography. Okay? So there is current, current work at, at PI by Michael Heller and Rob Myers where they've taken this type of ideas and they now propose a new way of doing holography. It's, it's, it's a new way of reorganizing the degrees of freedom at the boundary, the CFT, can be reorganized 
uh, in a different way and give rise to the sitter in the bulk. So, you know, uh, if you didn't make, if what I said didn't make a lot of sense, I apologize. Uh, uh, but uh, there is so much I, I can explain. The point being that tensor networks are being taken very seriously in the context of holography, um, at least for some, by some people. Okay, so I want to, any question? Uh -huh. uh, so I want to finish, I want to summarize the course. We have three weeks. We, the first week we talked about diagonalization of Hamiltonians. Um, the second week about ground state entanglement. Was that the question? Okay, good. Um, and the third week we've been talking about tensor networks and there was a clear logic here, right? So in the first week we learned how to diagonalize Hamiltonians so that in the second week we could study ground states and in particular their entanglement. And then learning what we learned about entanglement, this area law and corrections, logarithmic corrections, uh, was the intuition we followed to build tensor networks. Okay? We built tensor networks aiming at reproducing ground states efficiently. Uh, and so and so we learn from entanglement how to build those. But in the process, we've also learned about entanglement structure because this tensor networks, now you can think about, say, you take the meta and you say, okay, I understand how a ground state of a critical system looks like. It's this uh, shell-like structure where you have contributions to entanglement coming from all land scales. Okay, so, so we've learned about the structure of entanglement thanks to these re successful representations of the ground states. And also we've learned, and this is the part that uh, this course didn't pay any attention to, but we, now that we have these efficient representations, we can go back and try to diagonalize Hamiltonians much more efficiently. Maybe just the lower part of the spectrum, but still uh, there is a lot of feedback there. We, we can use these tensor networks as basis for numerical techniques. There was a list of applications of tensor networks that are being used nowadays. And there was quantum chemistry, statistical mechanics, quantum gravity, holography, machine learning, and so on. And today I briefly mentioned statistical mechanics and holography. And then what's next? Or what, what did we not do that we could have done if we were more serious about computational physics? Well, these this, this first two weeks were about Julia. We haven't talked about Julia for a week. And I know that you've been doing the homework, so um, there was Julia involved on your side, but not on mine. Um, what would be natural is to actually understand how to implement all these ideas in Julia. And that's something I cannot do in the next, in the, the next two minutes. So, uh, um, but what I thought was a good idea is if you want to learn a bit more, just to complement these lectures, I'm still not going to teach you how to do that in, in, in a couple of days. But if you want to learn more, Eric Schneta, which is a computer, computational scientist at Perimeter, has agreed to give us a talk on Tuesday, okay, 11.30, here, uh, on computational physics, in general, just to give you a bigger picture. And then followed by a second talk on Julia on Wednesday, okay, at the same time, same place. And these talks will be open to everyone at PI, but they are directed to you, okay, in case you are interested. And then... Specifically, Marcus, this is the picture I could find. <laughs> you like it, huh? Uh, so will actually provide us with some tips uh, and some basic uh, information about how to use uh, tensor. Uh, well, he, he's developed some, some functions to deal with tensor networks with Julia. And so he'll briefly describe those functions and will give you access to them and, you know, in case you are interested in doing more. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>